So we're talking about Christian ethics, but we need to start with a discussion of ethics. Because Christian ethics is a subset of the larger philosophical topic of ethics. Those of you who took our philosophical theology course, there was one week where we dealt with what's called axiology, which is one of the fields of philosophy. Axiology has to do with values. And there's two categories within philosophy that are values oriented or axiological. One is ethics. The other is aesthetics. Both of them have to do with value. The value of what is good, the value of what is beautiful. All right? That won't be on the test this time. But <laughs> ethics or moral philosophy is the branch of philosophy that deals with determining the proper course of action for human beings, involving particularly as a, as a course of study, systematizing, defending, and recommending concepts or right of right or wrong behavior. Ethics basically investigates the questions, what is the best way for people to live? Or, what actions are right or wrong in particular circumstances? How do we decide? And in the, in the process of going through this course, we will, again today I'm introducing ethics in general, and we will get into the, the more refined, the more particular, which is our focus, which is Christian ethics. But it is a very complicated human endeavor to figure out what is right versus what is wrong? What is good versus what is bad? Sometimes it's obvious. It's always, it's always bad to abuse children or kick the cat or whatever. But the easy ones are the minority. Often the issue of deciding what is good or bad, right or wrong, is very complicated. And how do you do that? Um, in practice, Ethics tries to resolve questions of human morality by defining concepts such as good and evil. What is good, what is evil? Of right and wrong, of virtue and vice, of crime and justice. Now most people when they hear the word ethics automatically assume that it implies something is wrong. Uh, Robin Lovin has written a number of books on Christian ethics especially and he has a great quote. When journalists, commentators, and members of Congress start talking about ethics, it is usually a warning that something has gone badly wrong. <laughs> You know, when Congress calls an ethics commission, what does that usually mean? Somebody's in trouble. Somebody's in trouble. And so for a lot of people, the very idea of ethics means dealing with something that, it, that somebody has done an evil or a wrong. That's not, you know, that's not the only understanding. Basically, ethics ties back to the fact that all human beings want to find a good life for themselves and for their family and for those they love. The issue is, what constitutes a good life? For many people, especially in our Western culture, a good life means having plenty of money, plenty of material goods, and the freedom to decide what I want to do when I want to do it. All right? For a lot of people, that's what they think a good life is. But think about it. If you have to, you know, if, if you have a good life, you have lots of money and lots of freedom because you're involved in child pornography, is that really a good life? If you have made a good life for yourself by abusing animals, is that really a good life? Or in the process of getting for yourself what you thought was a good life, you end up being, you know, just a complete pain in the backside to everybody in your whole life, and they all can't stand you. Is that a good life? So in a broader sense, the good life must include make the ability to make decisions about what is good, about what accounts as a quality or a virtuous life because a good life if you just pursue doing anything you want however you want then invariably and we you know we all know the examples of that that can lead to damage pain boredom and unpleasantness why do so many pe wealthy people who are famous who have everything you can imagine who have all the money and all the freedom and all the everything why do so many of them kill themselves because their definition of what constituted a good life when they actually got it, it was so unsatisfying they didn't know where to go from there. You all know the, the poem by uh, Edwin Arlson Robinson, or at least you know the song by Simon and Garfunkel, Richard Corey. They say that Richard Corey owns one half of this whole town with the usual collections to spread his wealth around, born into a society of bankers only child. He had everything a man could want, power, grace, and style, but I work in his factory. And I curse the life I'm living, and I curse my poverty, and I wish that I could be Richard Corey. Well, at the end of that poem, and of that song, it says, um, 
that Richard Corey went home last night and put a bullet in his head. Richard Corey had everything that most people, including the, the narrator of that poem and song, thought was the good life. But he kills himself because it wasn't good. That means there was an ethical problem with regard to what is really good. Okay? Um, so ethics is the proper course of study that answers the question, what is good? How do I have a good life? How do I decide what is virtuous? How do I decide what I should be doing with my life? And as I said earlier, everybody does this. You do it every day. If you didn't, you would never get out of bed. You make decisions every day about what's the right thing to do. Today you decided the right thing to do was to take a course in Christian ethics. You decided not to step on the heads of those kittens when you walked in the door out there. You make decisions all the time that are ethical decisions. And most of them are natural, they're easy, you don't even think about it. But what about when you do have to think about it? What basis do you use to decide ethical questions? So we're all ethicists, but we all have to decide what is the system, when it gets difficult, when the questions are not so easy or so automatic, what do I use as the criteria by which I may make the right ethical decisions, especially as a Christian? But we're talking about general ethics first. Okay? So, in the philosophy of ethics, the question is, what is right? What is good? What is true? The problem is, sometimes it's difficult to discern what is best, what is good, what is true. If it wasn't hard sometimes, we wouldn't need to talk about it. There wouldn't be a field of ethics, most especially of Christian ethics. How do we discern moral truth? What is morally right? What is morally wrong? We all know the big examples. Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, you know, Pol Pot, obvious, obvious moral evils. But somewhere, what about the gray areas where it's not clear, where people disagree on this? What principles can guide us in our moral decision-making? Is there even any such thing as moral truth? And these next several points, and, and these are issues that philosophical ethics deals with, is morality just a matter of opinion and emotions, what you prefer, what feels better to you? And what role does religious belief properly play in ethics? This particularly gets to be a question with regard to Christian ethics. Now these questions, what principles are there to guide us? Um, is there any such thing as moral truth? Is morality just a matter of opinion and emotions? And what role does religious belief play? It's fascinating to me as I was preparing for the three courses that we have this term, which are Christian ethics, worship, and apologetics to response to the new atheists. There is such overlap in all three of those, especially between ethics and response to the new atheists. Because the new atheists, in fact, atheism in general, would insist that to the question, is there even such a thing as moral truth, they would go, no. There is no absolute moral truth. It's something we made up. And it's based upon your digestion or what feels better to you. It's an emotional thing. There is no, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a minute, that uh, it's just a matter of emotion and opinions. And everybody differs, different cultures differ, different people differ. Now that's what they would say. That is not a Christian viewpoint. See, as I'm introducing general ethics, we have to talk about this. When we get to Christian ethics, I'll be a little more definitive in terms of what I think the Christian understanding is. And when we say what role does religious belief properly uh, play in ethics, as Christians, we absolutely believe that our religious belief are critical to our ethical decisions. But a Buddhist would have a different set of standards. And a follower of the Jain religion would feel differently, and an atheist very differently about that. Would say, no, our religious, religious beliefs don't have any place in that. So, the philosophy of ethics seeks to confront the need to find a connection between ethical theory and ethical practice, especially since some ethical situations simply aren't morally clear. It is not obvious. The Carolyn and I talked about this one this morning, and I'll come back to this a little bit later. If not today, then next week. Um, the county court clerk in Kentucky, Kim Davis, is it? Is that her name? Who decided that it is against her Christian beliefs to provide marriage licenses to homosexual couples. Is that an easy one? 
Is there not some sense in which we have to have some ethical principles or standards that we evaluate right or wrong? She clearly has a set of standards that she's evaluating that on that has to do with her religious beliefs. Do we agree with her or not? If we don't agree with her, why don't we agree with her? Because we think that as an as a employee of the state government, she has an obligation to fulfill the, the obligations of a state, a government position, or is it because we support you know, uh, gay marriage? Or on what basis do we make those determinations? How do we decide either, she, yes, she's right in doing what she did, or no, she's wrong? Interestingly enough, you know, she's, she's been the, the, the effigy, the poster, poster boy, sort of for closed-mindedness, and every, she's been so demonized in the American press. Well, the Pope met with her, Pope Francis, when he was in the U.S., and he later made a statement that people have an obligation to maintain their own personal convictions in whatever employment they have, which would suggest that he was supporting her. I'm not saying he was, but it's, it implied that. He didn't come right out and say she was right, but it sort of sounded like that. So maybe it's not as black and white as the media makes it out. There's, there are examples of ethical quandaries. Other kinds of questions. If you knew that you could get away with a very profitable crime and no one would be hurt, would you do it? What about if you said, I really want to get this money because I can use it to build a shelter for orphan children or feed the hungry or whatever? Would you do it? What's the higher value? Now, when I say you could steal, you could commit a crime to get away with it, I'll give you a specific example. Are you familiar with the expressions either salami slicing or penny shaving? We have had examples where people, in, with bank transactions or with stock transactions, have put in algorithms that would take one or two cents out of every transaction. Nobody know, For a long time, nobody even noticed it. Certainly nobody was hurt by it. If somebody took one or two cents from you, you're not going to be broken by that. Well, you take one or two cents out of 10 million transactions, all of a sudden, it's something. You know, it's like Everett Dirksen said about the federal budget. He said a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. <laughs> and yet, here, nobody seemed to have actually gotten hurt. Nobody lost more than a few pennies. Suppose the person who did that salami slicing or penny shaving took the money and used it for something really worthwhile. Does that justify it? What do you think? No. Yes or no? No. No? Why not? Stealing stealing. You have just reflected, and, and, and appropriately, I, I, I agree with you by the way, you have just reflected a particular way of approaching ethics that we're going to talk about. You didn't know it, but when you said that, you declared yourself to be a deontologist. Really? Yes. Which I knew what that was. <laughs> You'll you find will. out in just a minute. You will. Okay. So, um, so what is right? Is it what brings the most benefit to me, like so many Westerners say? <laughs> Is it what brings the most benefit to other people? This doesn't, it's no, not working every time you do low. Is it what brings the most benefit to the most people? You guys remember the death of Spock in the Star Trek movies? Yes. Do you remember what Spock said when he's on the other side of that, you know, of that glass shield and he's, he's dying from radiation poisoning? He puts his hand up and Kirk is on the other side and Spock, as he's dying, he says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one. So is the benefit to the most people a criteria for deciding what's right and what's wrong? Spock thought so. Didn't he recant later in another movie after that? It was like something that said he was crazy or about, you know, there was something that recanted that. Well, I think later on he said something like, that's illogical. You yes. know. <laughs> there's something that, yeah, there's something. But, but that was just in order to make it, you know, make it, well, it's a movie after all, you know, that's to make it, I don't think he was really making a philosophical point, so it's just a <laughs> cinematographic point. Um, so what does it mean to act morally? And what are our motives for doing so? What causes us to say, you should do this and not do that? This is right and this is wrong. This is good and this is bad. Now, again, I'm not talking about the obvious cases. What about when it's not so easy to tell? The Kim Davis case, or the penny shaving if they were doing this in order to try to feed hungry people around the world, or whatever else it might be. 
How far should we or will we go to act morally and do what is right even if the results are unpleasant? Even if they're unpleasant, if they're unpleasant for us, how far will we go? If they're unpleasant for others, how far will we go? And on what do we decide that? Am I putting you guys in a pickle? Because that's my intention right now. Well, it's to cause you to think, yeah, this isn't maybe so easy. If all of our understanding and knowledge of life, of God, of philosophy, etc., doesn't translate into a better life, then what good is it? Because what constitutes a better life? What constitutes a good life? And a good life for who? Me? Or mine? Or the orphans of the world? Or the abused animals? Or for who? Okay. How do we apply our reason in that? Okay, a little bit more about the study of ethics in general. There are three major areas of study within ethics, and I'm trying to give you all a foundation on which we will build as we go along into this course. By the way, I didn't say this before. Most of you who've been in classes know this. If you have any questions, I can stop at any time. All right, this is not a request. Let me, you know, raise your hand, let me know if you have a question, whatever. Rick. The Robin Hood uh, syndrome. Right. Okay. You steal from the rich and give to the poor. Right. Okay. Is Robin Hood a good guy or a bad guy? Mm -hmm. Bad. Bad. Really? How many of you think Robin Hood was a bad guy? Raise your hand. How many of you think Robin Hood was a good guy? How many of you really have no idea? Okay. The Robin Hood example. Steal from the rich in order to give to the poor. I mean, Whatever you think, how is Robin Hood always represented in the movies and in the books, etc.? Who's the good guy in those things? He's the good guy. That's an ethical differentiation. And I'm interested that so many of you say he's a bad guy. Because typically, you know, it's almost universal in, in all the references to him. All the movies, all the TV shows, all the books, that he's the good guy. Yes? It is steal from the bad to give to the poor. Yeah. The, bad and the, the rich are also the bad. Okay, here's, here's another layer of the ethical question is the rich that he's stealing from are also evil. The sheriff of Nottingham is, is an evil guy. Okay, so he's not only stealing from the rich to give to the poor, he's stealing from the evil rich to no, give to the is. innocent poor. Yeah. That's how it's represented. Yes, Lydia? Isn't that still stealing? No okay. matter it be from good, bad, or whatever. Okay, isn't that still stealing? You need to sit next to Catherine because you're both deontologists. And I'll explain in a minute what that means. De deontology, deont is, is the word for duty or rule or standard. Some people believe that there are rules, there are laws, there are standards, there are norms. It may be that it is, you know, it's the Ten Commandments, it may be it's the federal law, it may be it's just the, the sense of norm of common decency. But people who say, there are rules, you know, it doesn't matter what you want or what you think or whatever else is coming along, there are rules to obey. That's what a deontologist is, okay? And all Christians should, and I don't think, most people are one or the other. I think as Christians we have an obligation, we're going to get to that, that we need to be a mix. There is a deontological aspect of who we are, but what about the law of love? How do we balance the rules with the law of love? You know, how do we balance justice with mercy? Carol? Well, and, and Jesus said that um, uh, man wasn't made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. Exactly. And so, so there are rules, but, right. you know. Well, exactly. I mean, the thing that, that Jesus was so <clears throat> criticized by the Pharisees for is that they were very rule-oriented, very duty-oriented. They were deontologists. The Pharisees were the deontologists. <laughs> and they felt like Jesus wasn't following the rules. Mm -hmm. So there is something in there. But that doesn't mean, you know, I, I, I start, my first premise is deontological as well. Just so you know, I'm not picking on you guys. We'll get, we'll get the <laughs> so there are three major areas of study within ethics. And all of these things I'm saying also apply to Christian ethics. It's just we have sort of a different set of criteria that come into the discussion. The first area of study within ethics is called, med well, let me back up. Uh, before I get into that, I want to say something else. Again, we all make decisions all the time that are ethical decisions. In some cases, we must make, and this is how we often think about it, a, a sort of critical crisis or emergency kind of ethical decisions. Uh, you know, the, the whole lifeboat ethic. You've got four people in the lifeboat. You've only got enough food and water for three. Who do you eat? Okay, or who gets thrown overboard? Or who, and I'm gonna give you, at the end of our class today, I'm gonna give you some ethical dilemmas. 
and ask you to respond to that. But um, I'm, the lifeboat ethic dilemma is one that's sort of foundational. That's sort of a, a, a general pattern that a lot of them are in. Mm -hmm. How do you decide the relative value of different people? Um, and so there's those emergency cases, but then we have the everyday, day-to-day -day choice, and different people come at that differently. Are you all familiar with Anne Rand? Wrote, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, Atlas, the, Shrugged. Atlas, Atlas Shrugged, Atlas and she, <laughs> she had her own philosophical school. Well, I, in studying all this stuff, I came across um, a quote that didn't attribute to Anne Rand, but I recognized it. It said, um, we must recognize the importance of our physical survival, of our well-being and happiness. We must recognize that our lives are an end in themselves and that sacrifice is not only not necessary, sacrifice is destructive. That's Anne Rand. Her philosophy would say, sacrificing yourself is never justified. Okay, yes? Well, if, I mean, in thinking of that, I mean, there's, if you're not taking care of yourself, you can't take care of someone as far as you can sacrifice. Right. Sacrifice yourself kind of literally and... Put on your own mask before you help someone else. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. on the airplane. Yeah. Right. Why do they tell you to do that? I mean, they show <laughs> the mother putting on her mask before she puts on the kids. Because if you pass out, you're not going to help her. Right? right. You've got to make sure you're okay first. I wish I could say that Anne Rand was being that, you know, that... She, no, she's nice. ...warm <laughs> and friendly and supportive. I don't think she was, but there is... There's an aspect of that. There's an aspect of it. Yeah, if I, if, I complete, if I disable my own ability to do good because I'm, to do a long-term good because I'm trying to do a short-term good, then maybe I'm not, maybe that's not the right ethical choice. Well, she was selling the reason and it wouldn't be reasonable. <coughs> yeah, that's well, she, she thought she was selling the reason. <laughs> disagree with that. But, you know, she did. I mean, that's, she, and she is a beautiful example of, of a, a very well, I like modern economic thinking more than I <laughs> yeah, well, but you have to understand her econo economic know, theory was based upon her philosophy. Yes. You know, she's a Malthusian. Um, you know, anyway, we'll, well, we'll get into what all that means. Um, so, there are three different major areas of study within ethics having established that. First is what's called meta-ethics. Meta-ethics is concerning the theoretical meaning or reference of moral propositions and how their truth values may be determined. In other words, it asks the question, where do our ethical values come from and what do they mean? If, if you were to, to ask yourself a question, should I or should I not eat this particular piece of chocolate cake, that's not a meta-ethical question. That's an implied ethics. That's a, you know, right now. What should I do in this situation? Meta-ethics deals with the bigger issues of where do the very, where do the very ideas of morality come from? A good example of a meta-ethical question would be, is it ever possible to have secure knowledge that something is either right or wrong? In other words, the, the big questions about how do we decide? Is there morality? Is there an absolute morality? Is there? Is it based upon some divine, you know, uh, rule that we were given? And if so, does that require that God exist? One of the apologetic arguments for the existence of God is the argument of, of morality. I'm not going to go back and watch the video from our apologetics one course, <laughs> but there's that. That deals with the meta-ethical. You know, meta means beyond or bigger than. It's sort of like. Meta-ethics is if you're at 30,000 feet and you're looking down on everything, what's the big picture in terms of the fundamental principles behind how we do ethics? The second aspect of ethics is normative ethics. We're not going to spend a lot of time in meta-ethics. Normative ethics we're going to spend quite a bit of time with. Normative ethics deals with the very practical means that we employ to determine a moral course of action. In other words, it answers the question, on what specifically, not, not is morality real, which is a meta-ethical question, normative ethics says, on what do we base our ethical decisions? And there's three models for this, and we're going to get into these models quite a bit as we go along, because um, it's important for us to understand these are the three ways in which people make ethical decisions, whether they realize it or not. And if you realize it, then you will do a better job of balancing what it is that you consider in making ethical decisions. The first one is called deontological or duty ethics. I, I described that a minute ago. Deontological ethics means you have, you believe there's a set of rules or laws or standards. There's a code of honor you must follow. You know, if you're a student in a, in a private school and they have a code of honor, you violate it. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are, you broke the rule, you're expelled. 
the Old Testament Jewish people had the Hebrew law. They had the Ten Commandments, but there's 613 commandments or mitzvot in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. They had, they had to obey those laws, no matter what. Um, and, that, and we're going to get into the issue of Jesus coming along and dealing with that as we talk about it. So the idea that there are rules, there are laws, there are norms, it may be just simply the standard of decency that everybody seems to accept or whatever it is. That's deontological or duty ethics. The second is teleological. Teleology means end result. Um, teleological or consequentialism. Now, what do you think consequentialism means? <coughs> It means you're concerned with what are going to be the consequences of what we do. All right? Um, is if I do this, what's going to be the end result? If I do that, what's going to be the end result? This is the the consequentialism is the ultimate version of the ends justify the means. I will make my moral decisions, my ethical decisions right now based upon what the end result is going to be. Not, not based on some rules. I don't care if the rule says that. I don't, you know, this is what, you know, uh, Robin Hood was a consequentialist. These people are starving. These evil people have money. Ergo, take the money from the rich evil people and give it to the poor people. That's the right consequence. That's the right end result. And it doesn't matter if I'm breaking the law in the process. You see the difference? Some of you responded to the Robin Hood question as deontologists. Some of you responded to it in terms of a much more of a teleological or a consequentialist kind of approach. But what about the end result? Lynn? But Robin Hood also knew that the rich guys got wealthy by stealing through lots of illegal right. they were evil. ways from the poor, not yeah. from the poor of their own. Right, we said they were evil. But see, a real deontologist would say, that doesn't matter. You still can't steal. <coughs> Thou shalt not steal. That's one of the big ten. <laughs> and it doesn't say thou shalt not steal unless circumstances seem to require it or suggest it. That, it's not, that's not in there. But they were both thieves, Robin Hood and mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this, so, if somebody else is a bad guy, if I do something evil to that bad guy, does that make me a good guy? How many of you all watched 24? The TV show 24 when it was on. Okay? That's all right. You can admit it. It's guilty pleasure. There was a scene... <laughs> Jack Bauer was the ultimate consequentialist. There was a scene in that where there was a, a bad guy. He was only sort of a minor bad guy. He was like a drug, you know, drug push or whatever. Well, in order to get in with this really evil crime family, in order to get on their good side and make them believe he was the good guy, he kills this drug dealer and cuts off his head. Entirely so that he can get in with this drug family in order to be able to eventually stop their bigger evil. So he would kill a guy who did small evil in order to stop people who are doing big evil. You think that's right? No. That's a hard one. Jack Bauer's the ultimate consequentialist. Okay. Now the third version of it is the ideological or virtue ethics. Virtue ethics says that the most important point is what does this make me? Okay. What does this what's this going to turn me into? How am I going to be affected by this? Now, and that's not in a selfish way. That's actually in a noble way. And, and, and let me give you the perfect example. Uh, in fact, I want to ask you, I'll ask you one of the questions that I want to ask later. Uh, now, because this is a good example of it. Here's an ethical question. If a person is found beyond any doubt, like they, they, they arrest the guy in the room with all the makings for a bomb. If a person is found beyond any doubt to be involved in a terrorist plot against innocent people, is it morally acceptable to use torture to gain information that might lead to preventing the terrorist act from being carried out? Can you torture in order to keep, to get the information you need to stop this person from create, from launching this, or participating in launching this attack? You need to find out who the other people are and where they are and when the attack's going to take place and how it's going to take place. Is it okay to torture this guy who you caught with the goods and you know he's a bad guy? Yes. Is it, it is okay. Okay. What do you think? Is it? No. There's different kinds of torture as well. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the waffleism approach. <laughs> okay, now let me say, tell you. Somebody who says, yes, it is justified, and this has been the policy of the American government, at least previous administrations, um, and that is 
if we have to do something that is abhorrent to one person in order to save many, we will do it. We will torture. And now, forget the fact that all the studies have shown that torture doesn't work. You know, let's assume for a second it did. This is a consequentialist. This is a person who says if we have to do one thing that appears to be an act of evil in order to prevent a larger evil, the consequences, the end justifies the means. All right? Someone who says it is never right to torture somebody, all right? that it is against all principles of, of religious law, of ethical law, of any sense of decency, that person would be a deontologist. There are rules about that. You don't torture people. I don't care what the circumstances are. The third example, which I'm using right now, well, go ahead, Joan. It's also virtue ethics, because basically what happens with, with uh, groups or with people who pursue this is that they wind up being just as bad or more, more <laughs> evil than the evil that they're trying to fight. Right, well, well think about the person doing the torture. Right, right. right. Well, yeah. the, and the example, the perfect example, John McCain, right, Republican previous candidate for president, against Barack Obama, John McCain was himself imprisoned and tortured in Vietnam. And on the issue of torture, which most Republicans had supported, you know, George W. Bush's administration and that movement, John McCain, one of the leaders of the Republican Party, was completely against torture. And when asked how he could say that as a Republican and a supporter of the administration, he said, it's not about, and they said, these people are evil. They're doing evil things. They will do worse things if we don't take action. We have to do it because these people are so evil. And John McCain said, it is not about who they are. It's about who we are. That is the perfect virtue ethics comment. It's not a matter of what these people might do and that it's justified because they might do this, which is the consequentialist, the end result people. It's not about, but there are rules against this, either laws or moral decency. You know, we have federal laws. There are federal laws on the book against assassinating or torturing. You know, we have rules against assassinating. The reason why political prisoners are not held on U.S. property, and I'm, I'm not making this up, the reason that they're held in Guantanamo Bay, or the reason why they were held at Abu Ghraib prison, is because if they're not on U.S. property, they consider that a loophole that allows them to do things in violation of our own federal law. Did you know that? That's why those people are not in U.S. prisons. That's why they're held in military prisons and other places, because the military does not feel that they are obligated to follow those, those laws. I'm not, I'm not saying that in order to be negative about anything. I'm not taking a stand on that. That's just a fact. That's why they're not in federal prisons. Okay. Um, so you're saying, well, it's against our own laws. And still, people think they should do it. Well, the people who say this is against our own laws, and so therefore you shouldn't do it, are deontologists. The people who say it's not about who they are, it's about who we are, like John McCain said, they're virtue emphasis. Do you see how where you... These are different ways of making those decisions. And which way we go, in terms of what standards we pick, affect our decisions. Do we torture or do we not torture? <coughs> yes, Richard. Uh, I have a, I make it difficult for myself because I, I use a real example and okay. then it gets really confusing for me. And that is, what if we had one person that would give us all the information for 9-11 and oh, we could have prevented that and then therefore all the things that happened after that and all the people who died and all the wars that came out of that would not have happened. Now, do we torture that person? And well, that see, makes this really difficult. But, but the thing is, with the people who advocate and, and support the idea of torturing people who are identified as terrorists, they're not found guilty of being terrorists because they're not tried. That's another thing. Is it valid to imprison them indefinitely without a trial? Our, our laws say no. But then they pass an additional override on that, which says that yes, we can, we can hold without trial, without any, you know, any of the usual restrictions, somebody who is accused of being a terrorist. All right? Now, the reason they justify current torture is they say exactly that. We are preventing the next 9-11. We didn't catch him the first time before it happened, but we're going to keep him from doing it again. So in effect, the same thing you're saying is why they justify it now. So these three ways, deontological, teleological, 
or our ideological, which you know is virtue ethics, is what it's always called. They never use the ideological term. Um, are basically, do you make decisions based upon duty or law? Do you make decisions based upon goals or consequences? Or do you make decisions based upon what's virtuous in terms of the people involved? Those are the three primary ways of making these decisions. Where, where would a situation like the schools in the U.S. have rules about the fact that you cannot share med medication or something like that? And someone, some kid saw uh, another student having an asthma attack, took out her asthma deal, inhaler, thank you, and gave it to them and, and saved them, yep. and was suspended from school because it broke the, the rule. Right. Where would that, something like that, or even go into Hitler's Germany, where it was against the law, you know, to shelter Jews. Right. Right. But clearly that was the right thing to do, regardless of what the law of the land was. Right. Um, where would that fall in those, well, those examples? The re it would fall in, in between. I mean, because <coughs> the reason why you get that is that child who had the inhaler and gave it to another student was dealing as a consequentialist. I've got to do this because the consequence of me not doing this would this child could suffocate. Right. The authorities in the school that suspended the child said, you broke a rule. Mm -hmm. I don't care why. You broke a rule. They were being deontologists. You begin to see that when you have different people who have different orientations toward ethics, that's why you get conflict. Well, then it's almost like you're deifying rules, like the rules are your god. Well, that that's not right. Well, and earlier I'm, on, I'm a deontologist. <laughs> Fair so that, that's not right. Lynn? Can it be? <coughs> this is all very that's interesting because right. our community group is looking at Nancy's book, What's So Great About Our Amazing About Faith. Grace. Uh, Grace, and there we have been looking at the story of the Pharisees and all their laws and rules and where did it lead them to. Right. A right. lot of criticism in the passage in the scripture, Jesus is literally jumping up and down and screaming, calling them snakes and all sorts of Whitewash <coughs> sepulchers and. Yeah, bad, bad words uh, in, in polite terms, but not using the bad words uh, about these people. It's the same. You were trapped by the law. You were trapped by the law. Right. You had forgot about God's grace and about the law. Right. That's, you know, and the child who innocently, <clears throat> whether he knew the rules or not, helped somebody with his inhaler, is acting out of love and common sense and compassion. But you need to understand. But see, that's the whole point, Lynn. That's the the whole point here is to understand why there's that disagreement. Is to understand that people are coming from different points of reference. Jesus was not completely against an ontological approach. I mean, he said, "I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it." So, yes. Can there be? Can, can one person have three be part of all of it? I think that is the Christian way. In fact, okay. I think that is what Jesus represented. But again, before we get to that, okay. we need to understand that the reason we often run into these conflicts is because there are many people who are absolutely adamant in one way or the other. There are rules and laws and you can't break them, I don't care. You have to make decisions based upon the consequences. Or, but what's this going to make us if we act like that? Those are three completely different. Now, I believe Jesus was a combination of those things, and I believe we should be. But where's the balance? That's where okay. the difficulty. Yeah. That's where the difficulty That's, comes yeah. in. Okay. Um, I want to do one more thing. I'm not going to take you guys. Keep your questions for a minute. I want to do one more thing, and then we're going to take a break for a few minutes. And if you wish to buy books, I can do that. The, the two books, if you want to buy both of them, is 730 pesos. Okay, for both. The last of the three major areas of study with ethics is applied ethics, and this is actually making the everyday decisions about do I or don't I, what's right, what's wrong, what's good. It's taking the kind of big 30,000-foot 30, 30, picture of meta-ethics and then the normative ethics, how, what, on what principles do we make decisions, and then applied ethics is actually making the decisions. How do I decide whether this is right or wrong, whether this is good or bad? And so that's what it ultimately comes to. It all boils down to that. This is. This is a you know a descending sequence of kinds of approaches to ethics. Okay, we're going to take a break and then come back if people still have questions on that. Um, all right. So the three major areas of study: 
Meta-ethics, the 30,000 foot view, normative ethics, deciding what principles or uh, approaches will guide, it's, I think it's still running, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, it is. It still says, is there a red REC at the bottom of it? I don't think she turned it off. Um, and then applied ethics, which is the actual day-to-day -day deciding, do I do this or not do this, etc. Does it say REC at the top? Yep. Okay. Um, now, related to these questions, um, and again, still in the general ethics, uh, is... Uh, I wanted to come in. Oh, yeah, sure. oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you go back? Uh, it's some time ago, and my memory is vague, but I, I've taken classes in business ethics, which to me, all of these are uh, areas are covered, but it's more in parallel to this rather than fitting nicely in these three? Actually, business ethics or bioethics or political ethics all are considered aspects of applied ethics. How do you well, take the principles well, and, where, where and make I'm decisions in a circumstance? Where, what I recall was that the cornerstone of the business ethics, which basically were corporate ethics, uh, were related to values, which were principally related to economics versus right. social, but in any case, where it really ended up being is the question of, in, your, in the example of your virtue ethics, um, or duty, uh, normative ethics, I guess, but the, uh, the distinction was always between utility, you know, what's efficient, that was, that, that's what's right, right, versus what's good. The, as you'd say, all of these. But it's a, what we're, the reason I'm raising this is that what, what seems to be missing in your over, overview here is the, the major impact that that business ethics and business values have on our, which is meta ethics, mm -hmm. on our whole perspective of what's good and what's right and what we should do. I, I just to me, it, it's a, a little kind of a. I, I know we're coming at it from a Christian ethics, but. Okay, this isn't. This is general ethics. But you say, where do our ethical values come from? What do they mean? Well, all I guess I'm trying to say is that the, the, the business ethics in our world today and, and economics in general seem to be the per, pervasive right. uh, basis for most of our values and our decisions. Right. It's not good for the economy because it's not creating jobs, so we've got to do this. And, and it's just a, a sidebar of all of your... Well, but it's not a sidebar. It's directly part of this. The business ethics in the vast majority of cases is consequentialist. Because the issue is, a business has to make a profit or they don't exist. And so the end consequence of a business, you have to be profitable. That has to be one of the consequences or your business won't exist. Well, along with that consequentialist kind of approach, what other aspects come into it? For instance, is it okay for your business to be successful and even thrive if you are testing your products on animals in, in ways that are really painful? You know, most beauty products, and, and, and they're getting away from that more. Typically what they would do is they would take this stuff and put it in the eyes of bunny rabbits to see if it, put, it, see if it caused them to go blind in order to decide whether or not there was a problem with people using it. Well, is that okay? Is it okay to harm innocent animals that are kept in cages in order to be able to sell a product and make a profit off of it? So while profitability is one of the consequentialist pros, uh, you know, values, which is necessary, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. If a business doesn't make a profit, they're not going to be a business very long. And if they don't, if they're not a business, then their employees don't get paid, they don't feed their families, etc. So there are real values there. But how far do you have to go? What are the other consequences that you're willing to accept? in order for that to be the case. Bioethics, you know, um, the recent huge issues with regard to Planned Parenthood selling, you know, the fetal material from aborted babies and even taking orders for it. Okay, huge kerfuffle about that. Well, that was seen as a moral issue, but apparently people did not have as much trouble with the fact that these, these were living babies. They got aborted. They didn't like selling the tissue. But what about the abortion that happened first? You know, you see what I mean? There's, there are a lot of different subtleties in that. 
And in order to be able to make determinations about those things, we need to understand from where do we draw our foundation for us making ethical decisions. That's the whole premise of what we're talking about today is background. And so um, bioethics, another thing related to bioethics are transplant boards. Hazardous waste. Well, I mean, there, there's, there's environmental ethics, you know, uh, there's, there's uh, military ethics, you know, in, in every military engagement they have rules of engagement, and those rules of engagement always include things like you don't shoot civilians unless they're a real threat to you, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some cases it means you don't shoot unless you've been fired on first, and so those are ethical standards that have been set. But um, uh, if somebody needs a liver, there aren't enough livers to go around. And so your case gets pre presented to a transplant board, a group of people involved in the medical community that make the decision, you get a liver, you don't. Steve Jobs died from various diseases, but before that he had transplants. He didn't have any trouble getting them, okay? Um, the weird thing is you can't, it's illegal to go out and pay to get a new liver if you need one. But, if you contribute a wing, a research wing to a hospital, you're considered to have made a significant contribution to the welfare of humanity, and your name will go further up the list. They take into account things like age, other diseases, the likelihood that it will actually cure you, as opposed to the likelihood of somebody else being cured by this new liver, or new heart, or new kidneys, or whatever else it is. There are people who have to make those decisions. Now, they will have standards that they try to use as a guideline, like survivability, you know, are there other... Carolyn and I just watched an episode of CSI Cyber, in which this guy who was selling drugs online, um, he got involved in it because there was this cancer drug, which is a miracle drug, and he was taking it, but his, his cancer had recurred now for the third time, and once he got the third recurrence, they wouldn't sell him, the, the medical um, the community would not sell him the drugs. Pharmacies, hospitals wouldn't sell him the drug because they say, no, if you've got it a third time, then you're not likely to survive. So we're going to keep it and sell it. There's not enough of it. We're going to sell it to people who haven't had cancer the third time. Mm -hmm. That's an ethical decision. Somebody else is more likely to survive. Therefore, we are going to help them survive and not you. You see? Yeah, but if they're the same standards, no matter whether you donated a wing or whether whatever, if they're the same standards that you apply, kind of anonymously, let's say, right. based on certain criteria, that I would say that that's a fair thing to do. Um, but I don't know that one of the criteria ought to be donated a wing. Right. And well, so, they try so to be fair. how do you decide what's the fair criteria, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. They try to be fair. At least we assume they try to be fair. And obviously there's always attempts to bribe them. <clears throat> Extremely wealthy people can buy organs on the black market. Okay. Um, and in fact, there are markets, you know, people who get kidnapped and have their kidneys taken. You know, that's an old story. Because they can, you know, because people can get, you know, wealthy, wealthy people will get very rich by it. And, you know, who are rich enough will buy those things. Okay? There's a final point that Catherine kind of made me think of it. Um, ethics involved also, and she talked about standards and so forth, it's what people know or don't know. If you don't know that you have a duty, then are you responsible? If you didn't do what the broader society rule was, so right. errors of omission or of lack. Right. A strict so, deontologist would say that errors of omission are just as serious as errors yeah. of commission. But if you, the, the awareness, if you don't know what's right or wrong and you don't know what's, what's good or bad, um, if you're speed, you if you're if you're going down the road and you're going 80 miles an hour and you get pulled over and the policeman said speed limit was 50 and you went, I thought the speed limit was 80. Do you get off? But that's common knowledge. No, no. I mean, if you really honestly think, if the speed limit was 80 a little ways back, and in, in, in this section it's been changed to 50 in Mexico, it, there are places where the speed limit changes from, you know, from 30 to, to 80, 100 yards. You, know, uh, you can barely. There's no way you can slow down in time. Well, do we believe that that justifies not getting the ticket? The law doesn't. The law says that ignorance. In fact, there's an old saying: ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance of law is no excuse. So, again, how do we decide? And the issue of, we can say, well, a transplant board has a very fair set of policies. Your eight-year-old daughter desperately needs a kidney, but she's also got asthma. Very bad. And so they say, I'm sorry, but that's complicating circumstances. Is your eight-year-old daughter of more value 
than somebody else's 69 year old father? I'm going to ask you a question related similar to that in a minute. You see, these are these are real issues. Yes. This uh, this is going to be a very interesting class. <laughs> <laughs> it's not yet, though. <laughs> oh, it is. It has yes. begun. It yes. has begun. But the this ball of circumstances that we could consider would it be correct in in backing off and and saying. Because what you mentioned about business ethics made this made me think about this. That we really, our ethic decision is formed by the thing we pursue. The good life. Our, 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 the thing you pursue will define your ethics. Your ethics does not pursue pers uh, define your goal. So if your profit if profit is your goal, that will define how you conduct. The, the, the path towards that objective. Yeah. If Christ is your goal, then that defines your ethics in pursuit of Him. So would that would that be? Uh, it will ethical? be. We'll get there. Um, I wish it were always that easy, but it's not. I know. But he, here's the other thing. I, I, I'm, I'm listening to all these things, and I know we can't avoid them. But I remember what David said. There are some things I just don't. I just don't. Uh, give myself to that are beyond me. They're just they're just beyond me. Right. And of course this is very intriguing, very interesting. And and society will force these things upon us. We're we're not going to be able to escape them. We're going to have to wrestle with these exactly. things. And Particularly if you're in a position of leadership. Exactly. And and there is sort of an assumption here, whether you all become ministers or whatever, that you will be in circumstances where you will help provide leadership. And so that's why a lot of this stuff, you know, you're not you're, you're not going to trot all this stuff out verbatim when you start trying to make ethical decisions. But you need to have struggled with this if you are going to be irresponsible. Now, again, the, when we get to Christian, um, to Christian ethics, Christian ethics is motivated by our following Jesus. And I'm going to give you a list. It is, it is what is in Scripture. But the example Jesus gives us and what is in Scripture is not always unequivocally clear on how to deal with the situation. And that's why we need to understand where this stuff comes from. Again, remember Jesus, confronted by the deontologists of his age, the legalists of his age, and Paul, same thing, confronted by the legalists of his age, he, they, both Jesus and Paul had to fight against them. And Jesus, his principle was, yes, there is a law. And he said, I came to fulfill the law, not do away with it, very clearly. And yet, he balanced an obligation to the law with the law of love. You know, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What is the second greatest commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. When they asked him that question, they expected him to give one of the Ten Commandments or some other of the mitzvot. And he threw him a curve when he said love is the greatest commandment. First for God and then for people. Well, knowing how to apply that in a way that is always godly is very difficult. An example would be, um, Scripture says nothing about using illegal drugs. It doesn't. There's nothing about that. It says don't get drunk. But when it comes to using illegal drugs, what, where do you look in Scripture or in the example of Jesus or Paul, any of the writers of Scripture, in order to have standards that will help you make the decision about that. Exactly. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and it also says obey the authorities. You know, the fact that it's an illegal drug makes a difference. But even though marijuana has been made legal in a lot of places in the U.S., the temple of the Holy Spirit trumps that. Okay, I think. But people would disagree on that. People use marijuana to cure cancer as well. Well. So there's a difference. I mean, that's the reason it's been legalized, is because they say that there are legitimate, you know, purposes for it, etc. And it's the plus people like it. class. Well, <laughs> that's why we're having this class. And, and we'll get into some of those. I want to go through a couple more things before we get into Christian ethics. What is right? One of the most basic ethical questions that we have to confront is, is there an absolute moral truth? Here we're backing up. Is there, is it true that there are moral values that are or should be true for everyone, regardless of culture or personal preference? 
are there some things that I don't care what you feel about them are true and right and good and you need to be obedient to that. See, this is one of the issues that I confront as a minister because I have people, I had somebody ask me recently in the lectures on Fridays, are you an inclusive church? And I said, what do you mean by inclusive? <laughs> well, you know, do you welcome gay and lesbian people? I said, absolutely. Absolutely, they are welcome in our church. And then he asked a very insightful question. He said, do you allow them in a position of leadership? And I said, no. For the same reason that in the past I have not allowed into leadership a guy who was living with a woman, he called his wife, but she was married to somebody else. The reason that I would not allow into leadership somebody who is, you know, was involved in selling pirated DVDs in front of Super Lake, or whose business was to help people cheat on their taxes, or anything else that's contrary to God's will. They're welcome here. We're all sinners. If you say without, you're without sin, you're a liar, and the truth is not in you. They are all welcome here because they all are welcome to Jesus. But I have to draw a line someplace. And so the issue, is, and, and for me, it's that there are absolute moral truths. And those absolute moral truths, the things that in Scripture are clear, and anybody who says it's not clear in the New Testament, set aside the Old Testament for a minute, because the way we interpret the Old Testament gets complicated, because we don't obey all the rules in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, there are several places, Romans 1, 1 Timothy 8, where it plainly says the practice of the homosexual lifestyle is not acceptable to God. It's unequivocal. And I don't care what modern society says, I don't care what, I, I would love to be able to say, we love everybody. Everybody's invited to be participating in leadership. You know, I would love for that not to be an issue because when I take that stand, who gets yelled at? Okay? Um, and in fact, the stand that we take that, you know, I use this just as one example, that gay and lesbian people are welcome in our church, but that they're not allowed in leadership means that both sides get mad at me. <laughs> that I'm being, you know, I'm being too inclusive, the fundamentalist would say, and I'm being, you know, judgmental. Those who would say, you just, you know, that those things, don't, those verses don't matter. So it would be easy for me to say, oh, no, there's no absolute. It's just the law of love. As long as you love. But I can't do that. I believe there are absolute truths. Now, the two ways that people deal with this question, I mean, there's two sides to it. First, there are moral or ethical objection, uh, objectivists. These are people who believe that there are universal moral standards. I will unapologetically tell you I am a moral or ethical objectivist. I believe there are absolute standards as given to us by Scripture and by God. Now, sometimes it requires interpretation because it's not always absolutely clear. But that there are, you know, there are certain things that are clear and they're absolute. This, by far, no matter what you might think, by far, this has always been the dominant belief system. More people believe there are absolute truths than not. Now, would you say that those are based on biblical um, directives? Well, when I say that it is by far the dominant, it certainly is biblical directives in the majority of the world that is Christian. Christianity is still two-thirds of the planet. Because the things make sense to me with an example. So what, what came up for me about the regardless of culture or personal, there are cultures who eat animals, right? Dogs, so do we. cats. Just the question is which animals That's we right. That's exactly right. And we eat, you know, cows and, and uh, what did you say, or goats, <laughs> right, yeah. and all that. But if people found out they were eating cats, they'd have a fit, right? So is it what, what's right or wrong then about whether you eat animals, period, what kind of animals, and all that sort of thing. So there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing in the Bible. Is right. there? They, they sacrifice them, they eat them. Lorenzo so, walked out here and saw the three kids, and he went, mmm, gato tacos. <laughs> <laughs> he was just kidding. But why is that funny? Why is See, that funny? exactly. In China, yes. they would be eating. Exactly. And I said, there's the old joke about a, Vietnam, a, restaurant, a Vietnamese restaurant never has any stray dogs or cats in their neighborhood. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's why I order shrimp. Yeah. Well, you know and, and there is. And, you know, we, we would never eat a dog or a cat. But we eat cows like going out of style. Well, somebody who's from India, somebody from a Hindu right, culture, yeah, would, right. would consider that they, their opinion about eating cows would be far more dramatic than right. our opinion about eating dogs or cats. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the cultural, that's the that, cultural, that's a total cultural thing. Well, yeah. 
that's the second level is moral or ethical relativists, those who deny that there are any sort of universal moral standards. And by the way, there's two other terms you may run into in your right reading. Um, those who believe that there are universal moral standards are called cognitivists, or cognitivism, meaning mentally we're aware that there is. We are cognitive of it, we're aware of it, uh, that there are rules. The um, ethical relativists are called non-cognitivists, or it's non-cognitivism, meaning they are not aware that there's any absolute moral rules. To be cognitive is to be aware of, in other words. So you run into different versions of this kind of thing. Um, the, the ethical relativists, um, there's a couple of different flavors of that. This idea that there are no universally true moral values obviously is the opinion of the new atheists. I told you that this class in the, in the Apologetics 2 class there's a lot of overlap. This is one of the things they run into. They, one of the standard arguments for religion, not just Christianity, but any religion, is that religion is what gives us our ethical basis. Religion is what tells us what's morally right and wrong. Historically, that has been by far the dominant truth. Well, the new atheists are hard-pressed and yet very active in trying to make the argument that there are other things that cause us to make moral decisions, particularly survival of the species. That even though I may be cognitive of it, remember they're non-cognitivists, I may not be aware of it, that it's necessary for me to treat other people well, so they will treat me well, because if everybody was not treating each other well, we'd die out pretty quick. And so that it is a non, you know, there's no divine rules, there's no absolute moral ethic, it's simply it's part, of, it's part of survival of the fittest, okay? Um, that's part of their argument. Now, um, the problem that we run into, and the moral issue, and again, this is Sam Harris and some of the other new atheists have argued this, if you carry this to its logical conclusion that there are no universally true moral values, that ethical relativism is correct, then there is no meaning to moral judgment. You can't say honesty is good and adultery is wrong. Because if there are no rules on which you can base, no absolute <coughs> rules, it is whatever you can get away with is okay. Anne Rand is right there, okay, for instance. Um, Nietzsche was right there. The Superman idea, that the will to dominate. And this is, this is the sociological conclusion from Darwinism. It's called social Darwinism. The idea that survival of the fittest is not just that a strong animal, you know, kills off a weaker animal, an animal that has better genetic traits that can be passed on survives when another one doesn't. Social Darwinism says, if I am strong enough or smart enough to conquer you, then that must be right or it wouldn't happen. That's social Darwinism. Darwin himself did not advocate that. In fact, he spoke against that kind of idea, that sort of translation of it. But many people since him have. Adolf Hitler, the Nazis, were very much along that line, you know, using Nietzsche. Nietzsche took that to a sociological conclusion. And so, the, to a relativist, they would say that honesty is good or adultery is wrong is entirely a matter of inherent survival instincts or personal preferences or the preferences of a cultural group. You know, we eat cows, we don't eat dogs. We, we eat dogs, they eat dogs, they don't eat cows. Okay? That, and there is, there is some truth that there are some cultural factors in there. But if you believe that it's all just cultural, that there's no absolutes, one of the dangers, one of the problems with that is that we no longer have any basis upon which we can criticize or be critical of anyone else's actions. Quite literally, if you carry this to the logical conclusion, then a serial killer who was successful in trapping and torturing and killing women and got away with it, it must be okay because he was able to do it. Okay? Now, that sounds horrendous to us, but that is the logical conclusion of this, that any Anything that you can get away with is okay, that there's no moral standard that you can apply. In other words, cannibalism. We cannot criticize cannibalism. We can't say eating somebody else is a bad idea, or there's no moral value. If there's no moral objective value, we can't apply objective criticisms or moral criticisms to people's conduct. Now, we may say there's a law, and you broke the law, and we're going to arrest you and put you in prison, but we can't morally evaluate that. Yes? The conclusions that you're mentioning, the ultimate conclusions, are becoming predominant in our society. And yeah. recently, I started reading a book that's super good by D.A. Carson called The Intolerance of Tolerance. Mm -hmm. And he deals with that. 
Well, is, and that's a very good book if anybody's interested. And Carson has written a lot on worship. I, I told you the overlap. D.A. Carson, I'll be using some of his materials. That's not one of the books we're using in the class, but I'll be using some of Carson's stuff in the worship that class. That Intolerance of Tolerance is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a super, super address to this. So, but you begin to see the complication of, of this. So, <clears throat> what is Christian ethics? It's important for you to know that with the start of Judaism, Judaism was the first monotheistic religion. And interestingly enough, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and Christianity and Islam came out of Judaism. I mean, they were developed out of it. Uh, a lot of, they all see Father Abraham as the founder. Father Abraham is the source of all three of the great monotheistic religions. They are all called ethical monotheisms. The ethical part of that is because prior to Judaism saying, this is right and this is wrong. You can do this, you can't do that. Religious systems did not have ethical standards built into them. There was no inherent ethical requirements to religions prior to Judaism. That sounds like a shock. But basically, whatever you could get away with that didn't offend whoever was in charge or whoever was strong enough to hurt you for having done it, there was no rules. Now, there were rules. I mean, other... other um, like Hammurabi's law early on, um, it was a it, there was a series of laws, but they were intended to maintain social order. There was not an idea that there was an ethical or a moral obligation that was introduced with Judaism, and has continued into Christianity and into Islam. That there are things you don't do because they're wrong. No other reason than that. They are prohibited because they are perceived as wrong. God says, "Don't do that." That was new with Judaism, and we forget that sometimes. One way to understand Christian ethical monotheism is from Colossians 3, 1 to 6. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. God says, don't do it. So don't do it. That's enough reason. Because God is coming back. And God will judge those who don't do it. Now, it's, this starts out, since then you have been raised with Christ. Since you are a Christian... You should do these things. Because, in effect, you are a Christian, here are the ethical obligations that you have. It is built in to our religious belief. It is a clear indication, and it says, set your, thing, your heart on things above. Because we belong to this religious system, we, as part of that, have been given an ethical system to follow. It's not always clear how to interpret it, but there is an ethical system built into the fact that we are Christians as there is Jewish. Now again, the struggle when Jesus came, he was a Jew who introduced a very different approach to ethical decisions. He both followed the law and he introduced the law of love. But this gives us the, this, the very clear idea that there are ethical, moral requirements that are inherent in our belief system. Christian ethics follows a lot of the same kind of principles. I, I started out with an hour plus introduction of, of ethics in general because Christian ethics does not veer from that. It, it believes that there is an absolute uh, order of ethical requirements, but it is basically still built on the same kind of principles or processes. I'll give you another verse. Luke 6. Jesus says, If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? And ran just wet her pants. Okay. Because she and Nietzsche and others completely would disagree with this. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Holy moly, did he just say that? Love your enemies? I thought by definition, if they're my enemy, that means I don't love them. Not according to Jesus. And this, by the way, is not included in the, in the Jewish law. 
We know what, what God even instructed the Jews to do against some of the enemies of the Hebrew people in the Old Testament. Um, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Lend to your enemies and don't expect them to repay you. Then your reward will be great and you will be the children of the Most High because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Jesus said that. We have very clear set of standards that while it may not give us the specific applied ethical thing to, to decide in any given circumstance, we have pretty clear guidelines. And the rules that we are called to follow are not the same rules that the rest of the world. In fact, if you really are a follower of Jesus, sincerely a follower of Jesus, then you should be expected to follow a set of rules and guidelines and ethical standards that even those who are only nominally Christian don't follow. We do not have the same set of standards as the rest of the world. But we still have to learn how to apply that, and we have to understand the process. Yes, Teresa. Paul says in Colossians 2, 38, be aware, be aware of the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, Paul was a philosopher. Paul quoted the Greek philosophers, who were the originators. Aristotle was the first, you know, the first to write an extended um, essay on ethics. Socrates had dealt with ethical issues. He didn't do a long treatise on it, but all of the early Greek philosophers dealt with this. Paul was an expert on the Greek philosophers. He understood the need to be able to think logically, clearly, philosophically, and to articulate a way that people would understand, become all things to all people, that I might save some, okay? Now, I want to ask you some more ethical questions. I've already asked you this one. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, skipped, I skipped something. Just a second. Okay, why don't I have this? Um, on what do we base our Christian ethics? First, on Scripture, both directly and indirectly. I say indirectly because the example of you know, using illegal drugs. Scripture doesn't specifically address that. We must interpret Scripture on that. But Scripture is the foundation. Secondly, the Christian historical statements. We have 2,000 years of the church. We believe, you know, not in every case, but in the vast majority of cases, the church, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has made decisions about what is right and good and true. Um, we have things like the creeds, the, the, the decisions in, in direction of the early church, the writings of the early church fathers, some of which were quite ethically oriented. St. Augustine, for instance, um, in the end of the 4th century, wrote the city of God, which it was after Rome had, you know, around the time Rome had fallen, was threatened and then fell. He wrote the city of God in which he identified the fact that the world is focused on the city of men, the earthly city, which he was talking about Rome. Whereas Christians are called to focus on the, the city of God, heaven. And so, and that became an ethical treatise, all right? The city of God, Augustine. Augustine wrote a lot on ethics as well. The example of Jesus. How did Jesus live his life? What would Jesus do? You know that, WWJD? Um, I think that's a very good ethical principle. An ethical guideline. What would Jesus do? Now, obviously, it's been used so much, it's trite. I... There was one, some celebrity that was on one of those celebrity poker shows, and he's trying to decide whether to raise or fold, and he said, what would Jesus do? You know? So they make jokes about it. It doesn't keep it from being a valid thing. What would Jesus do? What is his example to us? Um, we then have the example of the apostles, the prophets, and the saints. By the saints, I mean all of those who were the people of God down through the ages, many of whom have, are good examples of ethical decision-making, who sacrificed themselves, for instance for others, who decided that my profession of faith in Jesus Christ is more important than my own life. That's an ethical decision. Self-sacrifice. Dietrich. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who went back to Germany against all of the pleadings and, and recommendations of all of his friends, both in Germany and the U.S. And he went back with this very clear idea that he probably would get arrested. The Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit teach us? Now, I put that last not because it's the least important, but because it's the one that people lie about most. It's the, you know, what the Spirit told me! I should leave my wife and marry this woman! No, he didn't. I know it must be, you know, the, the law of love, right? Well, 
I love this woman so much. I know it must be God's will, so I'm leaving my wife and kids and I'm going to marry her. No, that's not God's will. That's not the Holy Spirit. You're giving in to your appetites. All right? You see the caution here. And then Christian theology, the Christian theology that came out of the Reformation, there's a lot of theology that's written during Reformation times and after that. Um, talk about worship in the class this afternoon, I'm going to talk about sort of the periods of time and how Christian worship changed, and some of that, you know, at different times in history of the church, at the same time that worship was changing, they established different kind of ethical priorities or focus. Um, how they related to Rome and the Roman Empire, for instance. Now, ethical questions. I've already given you this one. If a person was found out be, uh, beyond any doubt to be involved in a terrorist plot, is it morally acceptable to use torture to gain information? And we got yes, no, I don't know, maybe. Here's another one. Under what circumstance might abortion be acceptable? Is abortion always wrong? Always wrong, right? Are there somebody? Yeah. Okay, I, I do agree that abortion is always wrong. But I remember the case of a lady in the community where I used to live, and she had a child that had some sort of brittle bone syndrome, and the kid was born with bones that just didn't work, and even nursing would break the bones in that child's mouth. So the child had a short, miserable life and died. Um, she wanted to have another child, and there was some question whether or not she should, because it was a genetic thing, I think, she should get um, you know, genetic testing before the child was born to see if the child suffered right. from this, so that uh, if it did, she could abort. Now, she didn't get genetic testing. She had another child. The child was okay. I thought she was really brave to take that route. And I know there are people who would say she was immoral to take that route. Yep. Because she was risking bringing a child into the world who would that was going to suffer. just suffer and die. So I think that abortion is not acceptable. But I would have a really hard time condemning a woman who faced that situation and chose abortion. I really, really would. Okay. Um, but I do agree that abortion is not acceptable. Okay. Yeah. Is, you raise an interesting point, and I'm going to get to, to exactly what you're talking about here in a second. That's part of this. Um, are there times when something is wrong? but necessary? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Lynn? As a nurse, I once encountered a 14-year-old who was raised by her uncle, was pregnant due to the religious practices, uh, and the fact that abortion was a new law in Canada at that time, they radically refused to even consider it. And she had this child. Um, child was okay, she was physically okay, but never mentally, mentally emotionally, and she did commit suicide not long afterwards. Okay. She just couldn't cope with all this. Well, let me, let me extend that this. Brings, you know, but that brings a question up about the people who perform the abortions. Like, as a professional nurse, at that time, I didn't have to have the right to say, I cannot do that. Okay. I cannot be part of that medical team today. Right. Well, let, let me keep going with this because these things all relate to this. <clears throat> Are there any circumstances in which abortion might be acceptable in cases where it would negatively affect the mother's quality of life? How many people say, no, that's not a good enough reason? Yes, Anybody think that that's a good enough reason? Well, what do you mean by quality of life? Yeah, yeah. suicide thing. Yeah. Okay. She thinks okay. the mother. Well, no, that's, I'm not talking about quality of, that's not quality of life. Yeah. The biggest reason why women in, in the United States get abortions, maybe Canada, other place I don't know, is because I just couldn't deal with the baby right now. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, it's not convenient in my lifestyle. It doesn't fit in, okay? But what about in cases of rape? What about the psychological uh, ex extenuations of that? When the mother's life is at risk, if she tries to bear a child, it's almost, you know, the doctor says there's an 80% chance you'll die in childbirth. Is it then okay? I see more nods. Mm -hmm. What if the child will be born severely disabled? And we can tell that now. And if, if you ask that question, how disabled must the unborn child be yeah. to justify abortion? <laughs> yeah. For instance, there, Richard Dawkins, the atheist, remember, I can tell you these things he broke for fun. 
He made a huge thing recently because there was a news article about a family that had that knew that their child was going to have Down syndrome. Had the child, raised the child, and one of the characteristics of Down syndrome, is, and it's, it's almost universally true, is Down syndrome children, and it's Down syndrome adults, are very happy people. Yes. They're very cheerful. They're, you know, they're very loving. Exactly. Well, Richard Dawkins came out and said that this family, that it was absolutely abhorrent, and they were irresponsible, and it was evil for them to have given birth to a child they knew was going to have Down syndrome. Really, Richard? Maybe somebody should have talked to your mom. Well, <laughs> somebody, somebody actually said of Richard Dawkins that, some, that a Catholic priest must have really scared his mother badly when she was pregnant. Well, in, in China, isn't it a disability to be born female? Yeah, it is. I mean, in, in China, they had the, the two, two child rule. And if, if women knew that, that one of their children was going to be a girl, they often would have it aborted because they, you know, they wanted male children. They were preferred. Lydia? Well, to me, for any reason to have an abortion, are we God to say that you cannot live because you're disabled? God does not make that judgment. If he gave you that child, he gave you that child for a reason. Be yes. it something wrong with it or something not wrong with it. We cannot say, well, we're not going to have this because there are some that say because God doesn't want me to have this child. That is not true. Well, I would be inclined exactly with what you're saying if it were my circumstance. But let me give you, again, let's follow this to the logical conclusion. When I was with World Vision, we were doing immunization programs in uh, West Africa, particularly at that time. I mean, they do them all over the world. Areas which are entirely Muslim. And we were doing inoculations against measles and various other diseases. Measles is, is one of the worst of diseases around the world in terms of number of fatalities. And we don't think with measles, if you get as a kid, you get over it, right? It's not true in developing parts of the world. So um, measles kills a lot of people. Well, we were going in and wanting to do uh, inoculations for measles and some other diseases. And one of the problems we had is that many, many of the Muslim imams would not let us do it because they would say, Aksala, if God wills it. If God wills that somebody is going to get measles or any other disease and die from it, that's God's will and you don't interfere. <clears throat> we think that's horrible, right? So why have doctors? Well, why, you know, where do you draw the line and say, beyond this point, medical technology can not be applied without being just as fatalistic as these imams? I'm not taking a side here. I'm just saying, think about that. Where do we, we all are, when we say, when we, when we say one of these things clearly is wrong and one of these things is, you know, that... Where are we drawing that line, and how do we decide where we draw that line? But see, it's so personal. Mm -hmm. So many people would have different, and, and it's our bodies. Right. So I would say that you don't have the right to tell me, because it's a very difficult, you know, situation. <laughs> right. What you apply your standards to my body? Right. So I would say I think abortion is wrong, but it's not my right to tell you not to have one. Of course because it these is. These are all of course it terrible, is. terrible. Can you ride in a car without a seatbelt and not get arrested or ticketed? Can you take illegal drugs in your own body? Can you sure can I you can. ride a motorcycle without a helmet? I mean, sure legally? I not legally. That's not legally. Like that, yeah, but I can do it if I want no, to. Right. But the, my point but is, you can't say you have to you you know physically put a helmet on me before I get on my motorcycle. If I want to get on my motorcycle without a helmet, I sure can. And you can be put in jail for and it. Now again, what I'm saying is, people who say, killed, but that's still my decision. Right, and I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, I'm pushing the, the edge well, there. But the point is, when people say, you know, no one has a, a a legal right to tell me what I can do with my own body, we tell people what they can do with their own bodies all the time. So where do well, we draw the line? I do. Where, I'm not where is it okay and where is it not? Okay. But that gets into the law versus, you know, the asthma thing again, you know, the law versus the asthma. Okay, I've got a couple more examples I want to look at. John? Okay, there's a flaw with the, you don't have a right to tell me what to do with my body, because I would agree to that. But when you're bearing a child, when you have a child in your womb, there's, there's somebody another, else involved. There's another body to consider. There's somebody else. And that's really, really an inconvenient concept for Western people, because we like to think of ourselves as individuals. But for whatever reason, God has decided that we, we bear live children, we don't lay eggs, we don't split like some like some bacteria. We bear live children and we hold those children in our body and nourish those children and let them grow. 
And there's no point pretending that it's not a baby, even at a very early stage, because it obviously isn't anything else. I mean, it's not a fish. Well, now you say that. <laughs> you say that, and yet early on, they don't really argue this anymore, because science has progressed since the early part of this, so that, you know, preemies can be born very, very early now and still survive. But early on, the big argument in the abortion question was, at what point does life really begin? Yeah. Is it a conception? Is it at birth? Mm -hmm. Is it at the point in which that, that fetus becomes viable if it were outside the mother's body? And uh, fortunately, I mean, there's, there's no way to solve that problem. And well, there so is. Wait, wait, there is. There is. I, I, just read, I just read yesterday where scientists have discovered that what the Old Testament said was true, right. and that is, at 40 days, a child begins to emit brain waves, in which that is the criteria for life. Okay. And that's when, when we die, we lose our, our, our brain waves. When, we're, when we come into life, we have these brain waves. That does not exist before 40, 40 days. And in the, the Jewish culture, if a woman aborted before 40 days, she was considered okay. Acceptable. Right. If, if she aborted after 40 days, she was considered unclean for a series of time because right. they themselves recognized that, that there was that, that life that right. began. But to that doesn't solve, that doesn't conclusively make the decision. There's still people who would argue that, well, at 40 days, you take a baby out of the womb. I don't care if it's got brain waves or not, it's probably not going to survive. So, so what's okay. the point of the argument? Well, the issue is, you know, my point is the idea that there's another life involved. Well, at what point is there another life involved? And, and At what long, point is it just tissue? And for how long? I've heard it should be up to 16 years and you should be able to... <laughs> 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 speaking of ethical arguments, um, the, if you're familiar with a modest proposal, which was uh, Swift, the guy who wrote, who, who wrote Gulliver's Travels, he did this as an ethical exercise, but he, a modest proposal is an argument that because the poor, particularly in London and England at that time, did not have enough to eat, and particularly not uh, enough protein, and they were having too many babies. The modest proposal, a very simple solution, is eat the babies. Oh, oh my God. God. No, 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 no. Now, th th your reaction is exactly why he wrote it. He wasn't. He didn't mean it. No. This was a parody. But the fact that he could make a very logical, very sensible argument for how this would solve two very serious problems causes us to step back and go, what are the ethical reasons? Why do we all go, ooh, at that, when it seems to be very logical? Because we value children more than that. Okay? I want to give you a couple of examples here. More examples. This is called the fat man conundrum. There are several different versions of this. Uh, there, there's a version called the trolley conundrum. If you knew with certainty that pushing an extremely obese and clearly unhealthy man to his death in front of a train would prevent the train from running over five small children, would you do it? <laughs> okay, but, but you're going to stand by and let five children die. When you could stop it, you could do something about well, it. Well, I could throw my own body. Well, you're not fat enough. You, you're not going to. You're not going to stop the. You're not going to stop the. This is a version. This is a version of what's called, as I mentioned earlier, the lifeboat conundrum. And that is, if one person has to be sacrificed for the sake of other people, then how do you make that decision? Here's another version of that. If you had to choose between saving a 72-year-old atheistic scientist who had no family or friends, but was on the verge of discovering a cure for cancer, or saving a widowed soccer mom who is, committed, who is a committed Christian with four small children, who depended on her, which would you choose? Do you save the guy who's going to help cure cancer, or do you save the widowed mother, soccer mom, Christian, who's got the kids? Business ethics. The, the mother. You save the, the first one because you're going to make more profit. Make a profit. Forget the problem. Yeah, it's not a business ethics <laughs> question. How many people think that you'd save the scientist because he's going to cure cancer? Okay. Nobody. How many people say you would save the mother? Okay, more of you. Some of you are just sort of stuck. Okay, let me give you a, what about this? If you had to choose between saving a 72-year-old Christian scientist who had no family or friends but was on the verge of discovering a cure for cancer, or saving a widowed soccer mom who is an atheist, maybe an avowed atheist, with four small children to depend on her, which would you choose? If she beats them. Yeah. If she beats them. Yeah. She's 
raising her children to be a Valentine's. She is Richard Dawkins' as mother. I, I still call her Dawkins. <laughs> Does that make a difference to you? So you would still save the mom, even though this guy could be responsible for saving millions and millions of lives. Okay? If you had to decide between choose between providing food to a hungry family with four children, see children always, you know, let's, let's admit it, they, they make the ethical um, question higher. They if you had like to, the heart strings. yeah, yeah. It, it, they used to, when I was at World Vision and sponsorship was so popular, we used to say, or one of the guys we worked with said that children are the window through which the world can see the need. Well, if you had to choose between providing food to a hungry family with four children or letting them remain hungry in order to try to force the father of the family to take responsibility and do menial labor to help feed his family, what would you do? Yeah. Okay, you think it's easy. How many of you think that in order to get him to care for his family, you would hold out? I'm not talking about starving the kids. I'm just talking about leaving them hungry. Because you think that would cause the father to actually go out and get a meaningful job. Would you do that? Yeah, but they're so, you know what, I know it's a situation. That's exactly it. And the father is an alcoholic, and the father doesn't take care of the kids, and the kids are, you know, starving on the street. Okay, now that's a situation where you're saying, if we don't do something, the father's not going to. I'm saying, what if you had an indication that he would? the father is not providing... And if, why isn't he providing? Is it just because he has a menial job and he doesn't make enough money or that he just doesn't work? No, the idea is he doesn't work because he's not willing to take a menial job. He's looking for something more substantial. Well, see then, well, I don't know what either I way, he might as well be an alcoholic and he's not providing. Yeah. That's so what we, in effect, do. We, we want to care for the needs of the kids. Well, the, the real question here is, will you care for the needs of children if it means in the process of doing that you will cause them to continue to have that need because you're not addressing well, the other side problem. San Juan Cusala, no. that they, well, they all have their hands out. They don't want to do work because they just have gotten this expectation that if they don't, that things will be provided. But if you provide for the children and you rate, and basically the children would be influenced by the family or the children are taken away from the family here in Mexico, if those children are hungry, they can be taken away from the right. family. Okay. And then you raise a child and you educate them and then they become responsible people and the father can do whatever he feels like. Okay, but you get the picture. This is all by way of introduction. Yes, it's all very good. Yeah. Now, all over the next seven weeks, we are going to dig into this a little further. We're going to talk about duty orientation as a normative way to make decisions versus the, um, the consequentialist approach. So duty, results, and then virtues. We're going to get into those things. We're going to look at more examples. You know, Kim Davis, do you think she was right in keeping her job as the court clerk in Kentucky and refusing, because of her own religious beliefs, to issue marriage licenses? Do you think she was, you know, I'm not asking for an answer now, but that's, that's one of the ones. We're going to talk about some real, real life issues. That's one. What's the moral stand? Not, not, we're assuming for a minute, not that she should compromise her own values, but does she have a right to keep that job if she's not willing to do what the law says that job requires? The Pope seems to think so. She should resign. See, people are saying, yeah, she should stay in there. Because, you know, what about if people in, in Hitler's Germany, if they had, in order to defend the Jews, if they said, I, if I stay in my job within the Nazi regime and I, and I actively oppose them, then I might have a chance to help more people rather than quit my job and run for it. Now, in that case, stay in the job, right? Maybe Kim Davis sees herself in that situation. So now, I mean, to me, it's like of the world or of Christ. And I guess how I, you know, people who are going to be gay and have the gay lifestyle, to me, it's we've already separated church and state. And so if it is... And this is where I, you know, would call it marriage, the Bible calls it marriage. If it's a union and they are only seeking, you know, being able to visit their partner in a hospital. No, it's now marriage. It's, that's, that question's passed. Well, they, so they it's now marriage. It marriage. So it, it is legally marriage. See, marriage is not, um, the only reason that ministers in the church can legally marry people is because the government says so. The government decides what's a legal marriage in the United States as well as in Mexico. In Mexico, the church service means nothing. You have to go yeah. get the government to understand it. And the same thing in the U.S., 
you have to have a minister has to have the government say it's okay for you to marry people. Well, and then is it okay if it, if it is a, if it is separation of church and state? Can a church say I do not marry babes? I mean, they can always go find a church that will. Mike, I was going to say that on Kim Davis's situation in Kentucky, there was a, a, a decision that came down from the Massachusetts Supreme Court by a famous jurist in the same slipping. A police officer refused to do certain things on his, as part of his job, and, he, and the, the court decided at that time in around 1900 that he had a constitutional right to his religious beliefs, but that he had no constitutional right to be a police officer. Right, and, that's, that's, and that was the decision that they made. Mm -hmm. that's, 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 there's that, but there's that question. Okay, let me. We got to stop. We're already six minutes over. Let me close in prayer. And hopefully you guys get into the reading. This is going to be fun. So <laughs> let's pray. Father God, we're truly grateful that you have not left us adrift to try to sort everything out on our own. That by the example of Jesus, by the gift you've given us in your word, and by the guidance of your Holy Spirit, we do have standards to look to. Make us wise in how we access those great truths, how we apply them to our lives, and how we help lead and guide others. We put ourselves in your care and ask for your teaching. In Jesus' name. Thanks, folks.